again, thank you to those who have led us so well in worship. As we now draw our attention to the Word of God, would you join me in prayer once again? Heavenly Father, we open up your Word and we pray that we would hear from you. Father, we know that you speak loudly through the pages of Scripture. And for this is your word to us. We don't doubt that. But Father, we do pray that we would have the ears to hear, that we would have hearts to receive your word. Father, it is our prayer that you would break down any barrier that would keep us from hearing your word, that you would free us from any distraction that would keep us focused on your word. Father, we pray that your spirit, as promised, would lead us to truth and convict us of sin, even as we read your word now. May this time in your word mold us into the men and women you have called us to be. May this shape us into the image of your son, Jesus. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ernest Hemingway penned a short story titled The Capital of the World. Ultimately, the short story is a father-son story. The son, Paco, as Hemingway writes, has a desire to be a matador. And he also has a desire to be freed from his father's control. So he runs to Madrid, his father, desperate to reconcile the relationship, follows his son to Madrid and then places an ad in the newspaper. It reads, Dear Paco, please meet me in front of the newspaper office at noon. All is forgiven. Love your father. Hemingway, in, in this fictional short story, describes that how at the next day at noon in front of the newspaper office, 800 Pacos showed up seeking to be reconciled to their father. In a much higher and holier way. The Scripture tells a similar story. The Scripture speaks of our need to be reconciled to our Heavenly Father. We are in a Sunday evening series walking slowly through Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Join me there once again. Colossians chapter 1. We will read the entirety of the passage yet again. Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Tonight, uh, we have walked through verses 16, 17, and 18, and 19. Tonight, our focus will be on verse 20. If you're ready to hear uh, the Word of God, can I hear a big loud amen? amen. And it reads, that the Son, speaking of Jesus, of course, that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the first 
born from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Verse 20, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. My first word to you this evening is reconciliation is available. We're walking slowly through the passage that we just read. Each Sunday night, we are taking it one verse at a time. In previous Sunday evenings, we have already seen that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We've seen that all things were created by and through and for Jesus. We've seen that Jesus holds all things together. We've seen that Jesus is the head of the church. We've seen that Jesus is supreme over all things. We've seen that the fullness of God dwelled in Jesus. And tonight, with our laser focus on verse 20, we see that all of these spiritual realities, all of these theological truths, serve a purpose. All of these things that we've discussed in previous verses lead to Jesus' ability to reconcile. Now, reconciliation assumes a broken relationship. Two parties that once walked together, two parties that once were in agreement, have grown estranged. In real world, real life scenarios, the, the two could be friends, the two could be business partners, the, the two could be husband and wife. But something's gone wrong. When the Bible speaks of reconciliation, it, it's dealing with a relationship between God Almighty and us. It, 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 when the Bible speaks of reconciliation, it's speaking of the relationship between God Almighty and you and me. When the Bible speaks of reconciliation, it's speaking of the Creator and His creatures. Something's gone wrong, and the Bible speaks of it in many ways, but commonly, the, the Bible says that what has gone wrong is sin. And you've heard me say this before, but I, I'll say it one more time. It's my ministry of reminding. You, you can see sin a lot of different places. Um, it, you can look at today's headlines and see sin, however you see headlines, whether that's looking at a screen or picking up a newspaper or scrolling through a phone. 
you can look at today's headlines and you can see news of political outrage and division. You can see racial tension. You can see stories of wars. You can see stories of sex trafficking and corruption. You, you, you see stories of all kinds of evil. Not too much evil to name. It, but you don't have to look at headlines. If you're brave enough, not everybody is, but, but if you're brave enough, you can look inside your own heart and find sin around every corner. You can look inside your own heart and, and see that your own heart is filled with all sorts of idols, your heart is filled with all sorts of lust and addiction and sinful passions and desires. The Bible just calls all of it sin. And Sin has consequences. On an earthly level, sin destroys our bodies, our marriages, our, our minds, our hearts, and so much more. Sin has earthly consequences, but as, as you know, sin also has eternal consequences. Sin destroys our relationship with God that destroyed relationship leads to rebellion and isolation. It's plain to see uh, whether we want to admit it or not. Uh, our sin leads to hell on earth and simply to hell. We need reconciliation. We sinners need to be reconciled to a holy God. We creatures need to be reconciled to our Creator. And that reconciliation is available. But we need to take it a bit further because... Colossians 1.20 doesn't stop there. I would say to you loudly and proudly, reconciliation is available. But then in the next breath, I want to put an exclamation mark on the fact that reconciliation is available to all. You read Colossians 1.20 and we're told, and through him through Jesus, to, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Once again, in this short passage from Colossians 1, 15 through 23, this once again, we're seeing the wide-sweeping and wide-ranging impact of Jesus. If you walk back through that passage in the comfort of your own home tonight, make note of how many all statements are in Colossians 1, 15 through 23. Over and over again, all, 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 if you go back through Colossians 1, 15 through 23, notice how many lists are provided. Whether this or that, whether this or that, whether this or that. This passage is stating in as many ways as possible that Jesus is supreme over everything. And here in Colossians 1, 20, the reconciliation provided by Jesus is available to all. The list is short in Colossians 1, 20. He can reconcile all the things on earth. That means everything. Well, what else could there be? Well, everything in heaven. Another all statement. He reconciles all things. All things on earth, 
all things in heaven. There, there's not a single thing beyond the reconciliation power of Jesus. Well, that might sound nice. It might uh, make for a pointed and powerful theological statement, but it has real-world implications. Yes, reconciliation is available. And yes, it's, a, it's available to all, which means it's available to you. The chasm is crossed. The, the, the barrier is broken. The relationship is restored. Reconciliation is available to all. So that, if you keep thinking through this a little bit, you keep thinking about the, the real world implications, that, that means that all sinners... All sinners can be reconciled to a holy God. All creatures can be reconciled to their creator. Big sinners, small sinners, sinner sinners. Those who commit the sins that we talk about a lot and those who commit the sins that we don't talk about enough. All of them can be reconciled. All sinners from here to there can be reconciled. Sinners who commit murder, or as I like to say, tax evasion, or even gossip. Think about it this way. Reconciliation is available to sinners of Sulphur Springs. And Brashear, and Como, and Cumbie, and Dyke, and Picton, and Saltillo, and Sulphur Bluff. That's all of Hopkins County. We can even go international. I had a little fun with this earlier in the week. Uh, reconciliation is available to centers of Athens, Texas. Um, Canadian, Texas, China, Texas, Egypt, Texas, Ireland, Texas, Italy, Texas, Turkey, Texas, London, Texas, of course, New London, Texas, Moscow, Texas, perhaps our personal favorite, Paris, Texas, and Palestine, Texas. Reconciliation is available. It's available to all. Reconciliation is available to those who might, in a weak moment, say, God could never fix this. Reconciliation is available to the one in a weak moment, staring their own sin, eyeball to eyeball. Reconciliation is, is available to that one that said, God could never forgive me. Reconciliation is available to the one who said, this is so dark, this is so ugly, I could never even hand it over to God. Reconciliation is available, and it's available to all, which means it's available to you. And we hear that, and some might say, I, I just can't trust that. It sounds too easy. Well, it is too easy for us. Colossians 1.20 continues... And it allows me to say that reconciliation is available to all through the cross. Colossians 1.20 in its entirety, and through him to reconcile to himself 
all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The last phrase, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This act, this gracious act of reconciliation comes through the shed blood of Jesus upon the cross. I don't have time for a tour of the Old Testament, but this phrase carries great weight if you have in the back of your mind or in your back pocket those Old Testament stories of sacrifice. This Old Testament sacrificial system where the spilled blood of an animal provided a covering for sin. The pinnacle of this sacrificial system can be seen in the Passover celebration where the Passover lamb and the scapegoat are substitutes for the one who sinned against God. Or maybe you're familiar with that famous plague story from those early chapters of Exodus where the people of God could take the spilled blood of a sacrifice and place it upon their doorstep. And because of that blood, because a sacrifice had been made, they would be spared. We walk into the New Testament book of Hebrews and we're told that Jesus is the ultimate and final Passover lamb. The Jewish historian Josephus labeled the cross the most miserable of deaths. I like taking that idea of the cross, the crucifixion is the most miserable of death and, and putting it side by side with Colossians 1.20. Here Jesus takes the most miserable of deaths and through the most miserable of deaths provides you and me peace. If we're brave enough. We can look inside of our own heart and find sin around every corner. Yet have peace. Knowing that that sin has been forgiven through the shed blood of Jesus upon the cross. You are reconciled through the completed and sufficient work of Jesus. Jesus paid your sin debt in order for your relationship with God to be restored and reconciled. Imagine... God writing you a letter that said, Dear child, please meet me on your knees in prayer. All is forgiven. Love your heavenly Father. Let us pray. Father, we are well aware of the reality that you are gracious and compassionate. You are slow to anger and you are abounding in love. We see that demonstrated upon the cross. And Father, on behalf of everyone hearing my voice this evening, we thank you 
for the peace provided to us through the shed blood of Jesus upon the cross. May we not overlook it. May we not take it for granted. But may we walk in the peace which you have provided to us. And may we point others to a Savior who provides forgiveness of sin and a peace that you can find nowhere else. Thank you for the completed and sufficient work of Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.